What's up, YouTube family? Welcome to the Link Up Church online experience. We're so glad you've chosen to tune in. Before we jump into today's video, we want to remind you that this channel isn't just for adults. We have content for babies in the Little Link Land section, kids in the Linked Up Kids section, and relevant services for your teenagers from the plug. So grab the whole family because we're about to get started. Be sure to subscribe to this channel so you never miss a video from us. And don't forget to share this video with someone who needs to hear an encouraging message. Let's jump in. Let's pick up with Faith Lives. We're talking about part eight today. <laughs> Just going to breeze right through the, uh, really the intro and, and talking and a synopsis of what we talked about up to this point. We really need to get to where we want to go today. So really, the, the heart of this message in terms of Faith Lives is that faith is an active relationship with God. And that active relationship governs everything that we do and everything that we are. So we're really talking about it is a lifestyle, not something that we run to when we need it. That's right. But it's something that we live and we really integrate this into every aspect of our lives. Let's read our foundation text in Romans chapter 1, 16 and 17, New King James Version. It says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, the good message about Christ or Christos, the anointed one and his anointing, for it is the power, the miraculous ability of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. For the Jew first and then also the Greek. For in it, the gospel of Christ is the righteousness of God. And it is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just, those that have been made innocent, those that have been declared righteous, shall live by faith. That's right. So the people who know that they're right with God and that they're innocent and the penalty of sin has been paid for, they live a certain way. We've been talking about seven truths, right? The first one, number one was sin is not the problem. So when we're talking about faith lives, faith knows that the penalty for sin has already been paid for and we don't need to pay that penalty again. Number two, grace does not give us a license to sin. Faith lives, understands, the way that faith lives, it understands that grace doesn't give us a license to sin. It actually teaches us to deny all ungodliness and worldly lust. The way faith lives, number three, uh, we're, is more conscious of its right standing with God and not sin. It doesn't sit around beating itself up for what it did wrong. It sits around thanking God for what God made him and, or her and the fact that they are righteous in him and those sins have already been forgiven. Number uh, four was uh, the way faith lives is it will never confuse God with evil. It will never ascribe anything evil to God. And we're going to pick up today with point number five. The way faith lives is that it will resist all forms of evil, sickness, and poverty. It will resist that. This is the way faith lives. When it shows up, the way faith lives is it doesn't accept that. Let's talk about what that looks like. Go to 1 Peter chapter 5, and we're going to read verses 8 through 11. We read verse 8 on last week, so I won't spend a lot of time there today. I'll spend all of my time in verses 9 through 11. But verse 8 says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, right, one that's opposed to us and against us, walks about like a roaring lion. It did not call him one. It says that he walks about like a a roaring lion. So he looks like one. He just doesn't have any teeth. And That's all right. he can That's do right. is gum you and lick you <laughs> and give you a big fur mane to lay your, head on, lay your head on and rest, right? Seeking whom he may devour. So notice if he's seeking whom he may devour, then there must be some that he cannot revour, devour. And I declare and I confess that I'm one of them. That's right. In Jesus name. That's right. Are That's you right. one of them? What about in the room? Are you all one of them, right? So if he shows up at our door, we've that's got right. something for him. The bottom of our foot. Right? And, and that's what we're talking about here. The way faith lives, it resists all forms of evil, sickness, and poverty. Let's talk about what that looks like in verse 9. Resist means to stand against or oppose. Then it's going to tell you how to do that, right? So if I'm going to stand against something, I'm going to oppose something, I need to know how to do that. I need to know what that looks like. Because I mean, it's not just me standing in front of the devil. Oh, no, you don't, devil. 
You're not going to take my resources from me. You're not. How many of you know that's us standing in our own power and ability? That's right. That's right. Right? How many of you might get your teeth knocked out for real if you don't stand and resist them in a certain way? That's right. So you don't want to stand in any confidence of yourself. That's right. You want to stand in all the confidence of what Christ provided for you through his death, burial, and resurrection. Let's talk about what that looked like. It says resist to stand against or oppose him, the devil, or your adversary. Then it tells you how. Steadfast in the faith. Now, this word steadfast here is important. It means stiff. It means solid. It means stable. It means so strong. And mighty, my God's plan for me goes beyond my wildest dream. Oh, you messed it so good. <laughs> that was good, man. You can sing a little bit, right? So let's talk about what that looks like. So if I'm going to stay, if I'm going to resist my adversary steadfast in the faith, then I've got to be strong. I've got to be stable, I've got to be solid, and I've got to be stiff. Mm -hmm. Almost hard-headed about yep. what God said about my life. That's right, that's right. Everybody clear on that? So that means I can praise him no matter what it looks like. Yeah. Once I find out what God's word says about that situation, I need to be solid about that. I'm not I need moved to be by what stiff. I see. I need to be stable and I need to be strong. If God said he supplies all of my needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus, when lack shows up, then I'm going to resist that. I'm going to stand against that. I'm going to confess what God's word said, but watch this. Then I'm still going to do my part. I'm going to give like I know he su supplied all of my needs. Right. I'm going to educate myself. I'm going to go to work. I mean, I'm not going to sit at home and wait on something to fall out of the sky. That's right. That's right. That's right. I'm going to get moving like I know he supplies all of my needs. If I don't have a job, I'm out looking for one like I already have one. And I know the one that is for me is going to matter. Manifest, that's okay? right. That's See, right. See, when I think about stiff, when I think about stable, when I think about solid, when I think about strong, right, in the faith, that word faith there is pistis, trust, total reliance upon God. I'm fully persuaded and I am assured that what God said will come to pass in my life. So that's why James talks about in the book of James chapter 1 when he says that anyone who is uh, uh, wavering, Double-minded. No, double-minded is unstable. unstable in all his ways. Yeah, yeah. They, they have two minds about the same issue. One day they're like, I know God supplies all of my needs according to the next day. Where are you at, God? I thought you said. Why? Right? See, when I think about stable, strong, solid, I think about Johnny Walker. Come on up here for a minute. Jo Johnny ain't getting ready to be moved by nothing. <laughs> you know what I mean? Literally. One thing Literally. I know about Johnny Walker, you give Johnny Walker an assignment, man, it, he won't come at him if you want to. Johnny is going to bird dog that thing all the way to the end. So when I think about something that's stable, that's solid, that's strong, it can't be moved. And so, so Johnny is believing God for, uh, let's just say, uh, his home to be paid off. It really wouldn't matter what showed up where Johnny is concerned. It's not going to be able to move him. Even if Johnny lost his job, he's not. I can't move him. Look how stable he is. Look, the enemy is trying to get him off of his spot, but he's so solid. Don't move, Johnny. You gotta stay, stable. stay stable. Yeah, he's so solid. Look at it. He's so strong. And now he he's also resisting. resisting. He's resisting. So he's not the just standing there out. taking the blows. He's also delivering the blow. That's Come right. on, somebody. That's right. And That's the right. way you deliver the blow is when the enemy shows up, you give him something from the Word of God that backs him right back up off of you. Right? And then you stand. You remain solid and you remain strong until that comes to pass. I promise you, you will outlast the devil every single time. That's right. If you will just keep standing on what God said. Thank you, Minister Johnny Walker. He is strong, though. Did you feel yeah, it? Yeah, he. And then he got a little strength about it. He got that football it. stance back up. Yeah. And <laughs> but if I wanted to, I could have took him out, though. I just want that to. <laughs> All right? So, so notice then. The way we resist him is we've got to stay steadfast in the faith. That's right. I think a lot of us are trying to resist him without having a real solid word that we're standing on. And so we become easily defeated 
because we haven't stood in faith. Faith is really knowing what God said about something and then acting on it, right? Babe, Let's keep babe, going. Babe. I just got something. Go ahead, baby. Go ahead. Really want to it. fall out. Go ahead. Notice he says steadfast in the faith, in the faith. not steadfast in the word. Ooh. And I've been guilty of this, whereby we'll quote scriptures. All day long. Oh, we, we good at quoting scriptures. Some of them, you know, I remember as, a, as a, watching the kids, when our kids were growing up, they had to learn the whole book of Philippians. And I'm watching these kids. I'm like, doggone, I can't even do that. And so we now, throw scripture. Clear, this wasn't their parents making them learn that. This, no, yeah, it was the school. Christian the school. school yeah, it was a Christian school. I know y'all thought we had them at home. Quote it, boy. Quote it. <laughs> Psalms 1 5. You better tell me what it is or you're on punishment. That's so, it, so a lot of times, you know, we, we'll throw scripture on something, but he's not, he's not concerned but just about what you know. He's concerned about what you believe. And there's a difference. And there's a difference. Because if I believe it, I'm actually going to do it. Exactly. I'm going to live it. Steadfast I'm in the be, faith. I'm not coming off of that until it's exactly the way God said it would be. Because mind you, the enemy can quote some scriptures. Exactly. All right. Let's keep going. Now, so now, this is what's interesting to me. It says, so we resist the enemy, steadfast in the faith, right? Knowing that the same sufferings or hardships are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. You ever notice when we get hit, we think that's, we're the only person that that's ever happened mm -hmm. to? Why is this happening to me, yeah, Lord? Not, not understanding that what we go through, Why every me, other believer Lord? in the world goes through as well. And guess what? When we can find one that's overcome, right, <laughs> in the same area, we should be able to look to that as an example and say, if God did that for them, I know God is doing that for me. Verse 10, but may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus. Watch this now. After you have suffered a while. See, we think Christianity is just microwave, uh, like just all blessings and, and, you know, everything is good. Popcorn. But the reality is we all go through stuff. Yep. Right. Right. Matter of fact, some of us are going through stuff right now. If we're just willing to be honest, right? But notice what the Bible says here. He says, after you have suffered a while, that term a while, that you've endured hardships for a while or for a season, right? I mean, you know, tough times don't last, but tough people do. That's right. That's right. Right. Weeping may endure for a night, but listen, but joy, joy is coming in the morning. Joy Glory is coming God. in the morning. He's the one that gives beauty for ashes. Yeah. So after you suffered a while, look at what you become when you come out of that season of hardship. It says now he's going to perfect you. That mm -hmm. word perfect means complete, complete and thorough repair. It means to adjust. It means to restore. Have you ever gotten into a car accident? And I, I don't know about you. I don't even like driving my car with a dent in it. I know. I don't know if anybody else is like that, but if you've ever been in an accident, man, I don't even want to drive it no more because it doesn't look like what it's it looked like when I bought it. That's right. Any, anybody know? And I'm just, I'm not right, right? I'd rather ride my bike or walk or I, I don't want to ride in the car, but then you take it to the shop, right? And I don't know if you've ever had this experience where it came out of the shop better than what it went in. And I remember one time, it was just my bumper. You remember this, but I had a few dents in the doors from people scratches. banging the doors, the scratches. And, and I had a good relationship with this body shop. So they not only repaired the bumper, they restored the entire vehicle. And I came to tell somebody today, somebody is coming out of a season of enduring right now. Somebody is coming out of a season of suffering right now. Right. And God is repairing you, and he is restoring you, and you're going to come out as if you had never gone into that season of suffering. And I, I'm, I came to give you some good news. Not only is he going to fix everything that went wrong in that season of suffering, God's going to add some bonus stuff in there for you as well. Some stuff that you didn't even and ask about God's gonna add that on to you if you'll just trust him and believe him for that do I have anybody out there willing yes, to believe amen. that God can restore and fix my situation up better than what it was before I went into that season right then it says here not only will he perfect you right I love this right here he will establish you that means to, to set 
to fast to confirm. See, God will confirm you in the presence of all of your enemy that they had the boldness to stand on my word to resist the devil. Now I'm going to confirm them in front of everyone that's watching this situation that they are my child and I did for them exactly what they believed I would do for them. And then it says here, he's going to strengthen and settle. That means lay the foundation for you. When you think about a house, what is the most important? When we think about this building, what is the most important part of a house the or a building? It's the foundation. the foundation. What God is trying to do is to, to really give you a foundation. So you don't really know what you believe until you go through something. That's right. That's right. A lot of us run around, <laughs> praise God, do all that till life hits us. That's right. Then once life hits us, then it's like what comes out of us is what we believe, how we act in that moment. And what God is really trying to bring us to a place where we really have a solid foundation under us, that it really doesn't matter what the enemy or adversary throws our way, we will never be moved by it. That's right. They can throw COVID-20 in here if they want to. It will never move us. They can, COVID-19 can go to COVID-25, and we're going to keep doing the work of God. Come on, somebody. That's right. That's all we're talking about here. Now, let's close. Well, let's slide over to James chapter 4, verse 7. James chapter 4, verse 7 in the New King James Version says it gives you another process of resisting all forms of evil, sickness, or poverty. I'm going to show you again what that looks like in a moment. James 4, 7 in the New King James Version, you don't have to put it up. I'm going to read out of the Passion Translation. It says, submit to God and resist the devil. A lot of us are trying to resist the devil without submitting to God. Mm. And the process is I've got to submit to God first. That's right. Then resist the devil. So you don't want to try to fight him without first submitting to God. Passion translation reads that this way. So then surrender. That means to subordinate yourself, to come under, to be obedient. In other words, if God said it, that settles it. That's it. I'm coming under the authority of that. I'm, I'm giving full obedience to that, right? That is submitting to God. I'm not arguing with God. I'm not debating with God. Hello, somebody. If God said it, I'm coming under the authority of that. I'm coming under the mission of that word for my life. Uh, Passion translation goes on to say, uh, the word surrender there means to subordinate yourself, come under, be obedient to God. Then it says, stand up to the devil and resist. That word resist again means to oppose, to stand against, and he will turn and run away from you. And so if you think about that, right, you've got to stand up to the devil, right? Everybody has faced a bully before. Anybody ever faced a yes, bully? Yes, Lord. Yes. A when few. I was in the fourth grade, I don't know if he might be watching. Everybody watching. Somebody watching didn't know Maxie Johnson. But Maxie Johnson you ain't supposed to about, say the whole name. Uh, uh, Maxie Johnson. Yeah, I'm saying your name. Like, I, I still have never forgot this. Um, <laughs> I'm in the fourth grade. Maxie Johnson about three times bigger than I am. And I came home and I told my mother, I said, this guy just keep messing with me. I never forget these words. She said, you know, the only way to stop a bully is to stand up to him. Right. And you know, when your mother tells you that, it actually makes you feel bigger than oh, the bully, yeah. right? Oh yeah, and but I'm I not gonna get in trouble. <laughs> man, listen, I went to school that next day because he would sit behind me and he would just thump me in my head. I went to school the next day and I said, if man, if he thumped me in my head today, I'm, a, I'm hitting him with everything I got, Kim. Right, sure enough, I sat down and what did he do? The words of my mother came up in my heart, said the only way to stop a bully is to stand up to him. Now, I make sure I tell the whole story. So I got up like I was getting something off the desk right next to him, and I hit him with everything I had. But what I didn't know was he was a boxer, <laughs> even in the fourth grade, and he had a counterpunch, man. And, and so I hit him with everything I had, but that counterpunch, kids teased me for years about this. He hit me in my forehead so hard a lump just grew on, the, on my forehead. <laughs> Instantly. Right, and there was a cartoon out back then. They were like, how many lumps do you want? Oh, oh about, about three two or, four. or three, about three <laughs> or four. Kids would tease me all the time, but here's the point. How many of you know, because I stood up to him, Maxie never bothered me again. Now, he still took everybody else's lunch, everybody else's lunch money, hello, somebody, but he never bothered me again. What am I saying to you today? Mm. You've got to stand up to your bully. 
right? And see, he's trying to thump you in the back of your head with poverty, sickness, spiritual death. At some point, you're going to have to stand up and say, you know what, devil? I'm not taking this no more. By his stripes, I am healed. And you've got to learn how to stand in that and walk in that until it is so. It's time right. for you to stand up to your bully. Glory to God. That's right. So on the back end of that, there's a challenge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I want to challenge. Thank you, babe. I want to challenge everyone this week to find an area of your life that you know you need to actively fight against. Some of y'all have been struggling with just lack for too long. Some of y'all have been struggling with sickness and disease just too long. I want, you, I want to challenge you to find an area of your life, listen to me, this week that you know you need to actively fight against. And this is what I want you to do. I want you to resist it every day, day this week until the enemy leaves your life in that area. And so with what he's saying, you know, oftentimes lack and sickness and disease is the result of something else. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes the, the, the thing that you need to resist could be something simple, resisting a temper, resisting cussing somebody out, resisting getting an attitude, resisting lying, resisting people pleasing, resisting social media and, and the negative effects of self, your self-esteem that it has. Sometimes it just requires you identifying that thing that takes you someplace where lack, not just financial lack, but you lack in the character of who God made you to be. Address it, write it down, and have your counterpunch ready every time it tries to surface itself. That's so good. That's good. That's real good. Because resist literally means to actively, actively fight against something. So if we're not, let's use sickness as an example. If we're not actively fighting against sickness, then we're submitting to it. That's right. Is that clear? And so when it shows up, then what is my response? I've got to begin to do things, right, that is the opposite of what's trying to attach itself to my body. That's right. Sometimes that manifests in the form of I need to clean my diet up. Yep. I need to start exercising. There's certain foods I need to remove from my diet. Ooh. Come on, somebody. It might even mean I need to forgive somebody. Mm. Could be a whole lot of things. I need to stop living in doubt and fear. That right there calls ulcers. All right, number six. Number six. God's will doesn't automatically come to pass for us as individuals. God's will is not automatic in your life. Now, he will accomplish his ultimate will, but he's going to do it with or without us. A, subpoint under that, Jesus said that not everybody will be saved. Jesus said that. I didn't say it. The devil didn't even say it. Jesus said that not everyone would be saved. Look at Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14 in the Passion Translation. Matthew chapter 7, verses 7, 13 and 14. It says, come to God through the narrow gate, because the wide gate and broad path is the way that leads to destruction. Nearly everyone chooses that crowded road. Wow. The narrow gate and the difficult way leads to eternal life. So few even find it. So few even find it. So, so, so not just walk in that gate, but you got to find it first. And he says so few. And so the challenge here that I would submit to you is not that Christians are just choosing to live contrary to God. I believe we get caught up in what's popular. We get caught up with what's common. And because it may not seem to take us in this crazy direction and it's not overt chaos, we find ourselves somewhere where something's missing, something's still not quite right. Maybe this Jesus thing don't work. And that's why it's easy for people to dip out of church and say, I, I don't need church. I still have my relationship with God. You got to remember, Jesus said he's coming back for his church. His church. His called out ones. The ones that chose to still be among the brethren. The ones that still chose to, to openly display their belief. That's so good, babe, because he wouldn't tell them <laughs> that and then contradict himself in Hebrews chapter 10. He said, as we see that day approaching... We should we gather to together, together more all the more. more. So don't get so settled 
with online church and with sitting at home in your bedroom with your coffee. Because that's going to be easy to do. It's going to be easy to do. There's, a t- there's, t- there- there's coming a time, even right here, where you can't grow unless you're among the brethren. And even being among the brethren that you might not like. It's part of the growth process. Now, there's a, there's a term out there. Again, we're going back to how faith grows. Faith lives. And how does this faith live? He says, come to God through the narrow gate because the wide gate and the broad path is, is the way that leads to destruction. Nearly everyone chooses that crowded road. The narrow gate and, is, and the difficult way leads to eternal life. So few even find it. Mind you, he said and qualifies that it may seem difficult. Not difficult to the spirit, man, because the spirit is always willing. It's difficult to the flesh. Mm-hmm. It's difficult to the outward man. And there's this here term out here called the herd mentality. The herd mentality. The definition, according to Webster, says that it's the tendency of people in a group to think and behave in ways that conform to others in the group rather than as individuals. So it's dependent upon what precedence or what superiority or what priority you give to whatever group you're in. So you have a family group with its traditions and its rituals and its ways and behaviors. You have a work group with its constructs and its uh, SOPs and its way of living and, and behaving and achieving. Then you have your church group. Then you got your neighborhood group. Then you got your friend group. Then you got your frat group. Then you got your sorority group. So what group are you going to prioritize? Because you also have a group called Jesus, the Father, uh, the God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's so good. So if I hear you right, then that wide road is everything you just described. That narrow road is the people that's willing to follow God, right, and make that the priority in their lives, make the Word of God the priority in their lives above all of those other groups. Exactly. Even if it means once I prioritize this, that might change my involvement in these other groups. Right. Most people aren't willing to give up the other groups right. to prioritize the Word of God in their That's lives. Right. They want to keep it in compartments, right? Uh-huh. Church on Sunday and then every other compartment every other day. Monday through week. Friday. And all of it gets convoluted. And before That's you know it, the believer gets swept away. Uh-huh. Exactly. And see, and, and the big, biggest thing, and I want to address this, the biggest thing that keeps us over here you know, when we know we should spend our time, we should know we should do something. Maybe I need to keep my mouth shut. Maybe I need to speak up in love. Mm-hmm. But see, fear can round us out and sand us down. Fear of what people are thinking about us. Fear of how they might respond. Fear of rejection. Fear that I might not get that promotion. Fear that they might not want to hang out with me. Listen to what Robert Evans in the Psychology Today uh, article says back in 2009. The name of the article was The Most Powerful Motivator. And he ends the article after going through it, and he says, fear is a powerful motivator, but it's a negative one. I prefer to motivate someone by eliminating doubt. Doubt destroys motivation. If you can help a person get rid of that, you will motivate them positively without fear. That's good. And right now we're living in a season that fear is the motivator. I mean, we're, I mean, like, really, there are people fighting right now over mask versus no mask, over Democrat. Ver- the whole entire campaign has been motivated, I mean, has been spawned on by fear. Fear of what you might get if you vote for this person. Fear if, the, if this person wins. Fear of what you might get if that person wins. Listen, you better get in your, in your closet <laughs> and hear from the Holy Spirit. And, and, and know God's word. And again, like Pastor Gregory said, being so firmly rooted in the word that, listen, no matter who you vote for, it's gonna, it ain't going to be perfect. It ain't going to be right. I don't care who you vote for. It's the lesser of two evils. It's the lesser of two evils. At the end of the day, there's one government, and that government is, is, is eternal. See, we're dealing with a four-year term, a two-year term, an eight-year term. That, this here is eternal. The government called God the kingdom of the most high. And when you choose to stand there and you're a citizen in there, they can bring what may, but it will not come nigh you. You know, I was recalling a quick example was I was uh, some years ago, it was a long time ago, I was a lifeguard. And I was a lifeguard at a pool in um, Detroit called the Brennan Pools. And this is like my second year lifeguard, and this is the biggest pool complex. In fact, they used to have Olympic trials at this pool. It's three different pools. It's a huge complex. We were surrounded by a wrought iron gate. 
But this is during the season of gangs and drugs. This is the, sort of the end of the huge crack era, right? And this one gang recognized that the other gang had came in through the, and was swimming in the pool. And so we're lifeguards on stand, on duty. All of a sudden, you hear someone holler out this call, and they are literally lifting other gang members up, jumping the wrought iron gates. Now, in that moment, in that moment, we have a decision as lifeguards. Either we're going to do our job and protect the pool and the patrons, or we're going to run, OK? Me and my crazy butt decide I'm going to fight. Because at the end of it, if I didn't stand against fear now, something else could come that way in that pool. And it's not only me that's suffering the consequences. It's a bunch of other little kids that's suffering the consequences as well. So it was about five or six big old burly guys. And it was, it was only four females. But those four females, I have a different kind of confidence than these other females did. So I'm the only female that's fighting. Now, the reality, just like since we're talking about fighting and all, the reality is the biggest game member thought that he could handle this little, this little Asian-looking girl. And, um, and I knew, even if I can't handle you, as long as I get you in eight feet or deeper, I got you. And so when I came to stop him, because they were stomping this boy's head in the cement, I mean, they, and there's blood right there off the pool, because they caught the boy trying to come out the pool. And they're stomping his head. And I come up to him and push him back. When I push him back, this big old dude, I mean, he bigger than Minister Johnny, jawed me so hard, I thought I was going to fall out. I mean, he reached back and he jawed me. I honestly don't even know if he knew who it was that pushed him back. But in his rage, that's what he did. But I just kept coming at him and pushing back at him until he fell in the water. It was over by the end. But my point is, in that moment, I understood that my fear would cost other people their health and life. You got to understand that your fear might cost, the collateral damage might not just be you. Your collateral damage might be your students that you teach. It might be your children that you raise and up. It might be your coworkers. It might be your mother, your father, your sister, your brother. That fear, if you want to stay in that wide gate, mm, that's good. That's good. Yeah. you want to go down that wide path, it may take you somewhere you really don't want to go because maybe you can deal with it. But the people that you took along with you cannot. That's good. That's good. That's good. And so this is what I'll conclude right here before going on to the next point. Ooh, I'm, I'm on some emotional stuff today. <laughs> You're good. You're doing great, buddy. Doing <laughs> and then so he says here, um, so then Jesus goes on to, uh, so later on um, in Mark chapter 16, verses 15 and 16, he says, as you go into all the world, preach openly the wonderful news of the gospel to the entire human race. Whoever believes the good news and is baptized, open, to a, open display and live for the cross of Christ. That's what baptized is, being openly, being, uh, openly displaying and living for the cause of Christ will be saved, delivered, prosperous, promoted, and favored. And whoever does not believe the good news, Jesus and his teaches mind you he doesn't say whoever does not believe on Jesus he says whoever does not believe on the good news the gospel that's Jesus and everything he talked about in Matthew Mark Luke and John yes. will be condemned destruction so a lot of people believe on Jesus but see they don't they don't necessarily have an embrace we haven't embraced the totality of what he came to preach teach and demonstrate see we got to understand as far as faith lives faith is a lifestyle it's not a project that's right it's not something we pick up because we, they, they gave us a bad report. It's not something that we pick up because we just got laid off. It's not, faith is not something that we want to activate. It's not a switch. It's a lifestyle. Right. It's a commitment. Mm -hmm. It's a commitment that leads us to a conversion. And that conversion changes behavior. And that behavior is steeped in wanting to please God. Yeah. And this is where James chapter 1, verses 21 and 25, this is where, why he says this. In the passion. So this is why we abandon everything morally impure and all forms of wicked conduct. Instead, with the senses of the spirit, we absorb God's word, which has been implanted within our nature, within our spiritual nature. For the word of life has power to continually deliver us. Don't just listen to the word of truth and not respond to it, for it is the essence of self-deception. 
So always let this word become like poetry written and fulfilled in your life. If you listen to the word and don't live out the message you hear, you become like a person who looks in the mirror of the word to discover the reflection of his face in the beginning. And you perceive how God sees you in the mirror of the word, but then you go out and forget your divine origin. But those who set their gaze deeply into the perfecting law of liberty are fascinated by and respond to the truth they hear and are strengthened by it. They experience God's blessing in, that way, in, that, in all that they do. So listen, choose the narrow gate. The narrow gate might feel like it's just you and Jesus, but listen, when you open your spiritual eyes, you realize that when you're God, you are the majority. That's right. B, Scripture says it is the will of God that none should perish. Scripture says that it is the will of God that none should perish. 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 and 9, it says, So dear friends, don't let this one thing escape your notice. A single day counts like a thousand years to the Lord Yahweh, and a thousand years counts as one day. This means that contrary to man's perspective, the Lord is not late in his promises to return as some measure of lateness, but rather his delay simply reveals his loving patience towards you because he does not want any to perish but all to come to repentance god has provided salvation but we must realize that inside of that salvation is the package of prosperity is a package of healing right. is a package of eternal life is a package not just prosperity in your financial need but prosperity in your relationships prosperity in your purpose prosperity in your calling prosperity in everything you do you got the you have the covenant of abraham wherever your feet goes the spirit of God and prosperity is right there. That's right. I don't care what it looks like. That's right. And, and, and when we respond to that in the salvation message and not just I'm escaping, he I'm escaping hell, then we have all that he has for us. To, uh, we, we represent or we can embrace and walk in all that he has died for us. That's good. That's good. You know, 2 Timothy, he goes on to say that... Uh, 1 Timothy, I'm sorry, chapter 2, verse 4, he says, who, uh, he tells us in the beginning, we know to pray for kings and all those that are authority, but then he concludes it right here. He says, who, who will have God, who will have all men saved and come into the knowledge of the truth. When we are, uh, when the deposits of his truth is within us, it ought to create change. Yeah. If you find yourself going around the same merry-go-round, the same merry-go-round, check what you believe. Yep. You are where you are as a result of what you believe, that's so not good. what you know. That's so good. That's so good. So that's great, right, in understanding that God's will is not automatic. A lot of times we think we get saved and automatically things are going to happen. So what you clearly demonstrated there is that his will is for everyone to get saved, but the reality is everyone won't. Many people are going to choose that wide road. Right? Many people are going to choose that, but, but it won't be me. Do I have any others? I'm going narrow. Anybody ra raise your hand. I'm staying on that narrow path. That narrow path is just simply if God said it, that settles it. I'm staying right there. Right? Now, let's contrast healing, right? God's will. How many of y'all believe God's will is for everyone to be healed? All right, let me ask the follow-up question. Does everyone get healed? Do we know why not? If his will is for everyone to get healed, then why don't all people get healed? <clears throat> it's a good question, right? So let's look at some things here, and we'll just close right here for the day. We'll stop with this section. It says here in, uh, let's look at Acts chapter 10, verse uh, 38. God's will is for everyone to get healed. Let her see. Acts 10, 38 says, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with dunamis, miraculous ability or power. And he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed. That word oppressed means Satan has exercised dominion over these individuals by the devil. So it's clear when people need healing, who's oppressed them in that way? The devil, right? So Jesus went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil for God was with him. So notice that word all, there is a big word. So he healed every person who needed it, which means Jesus has the capacity to heal every person that needs it. Do we believe that? Yeah, right? He literally called healing all good. 
So then sickness and disease and oppression must be bad. But God here called healing all good. So look at letter D. Letter D, I added some language to this. Not everyone receives their healing, and write this in, it's not in your notes, on this side of heaven. Not everyone receives their healing on this side of heaven. All right, so God's will is for everyone to be healed. Letter C, letter D, but not everyone receives their healing on this side of heaven. All right, I want to make this as plain as I possibly can. On last week, we talked about Jesus hasn't healed anyone in over 2,000 years. He's done his piece. His part is over. Now we have to respond to what we believe he's done. I'm going to show that to you more clearly in the word today. Let's look at 1 Peter 2.24. He or who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we having died to sins might live for righteousness. By whose stripes you what? Were healed. You what? Were healed. All right, when did that happen? Over 2,000 years ago, right? All right, so now, if we were healed, then we are healed, correct? So it's a choice to believe that or not believe that, right? So now, let's look at it another way. Go to Hebrews chapter 10. So what I want to really encourage our hearts, though, even though people don't get healed on this side, they still get it on the other side. And, you know, so when our brothers and sisters, did you want to ask something? No, go ahead. I'm sorry. When our brothers and sisters die in Christ, I mean, even though cancer may have been the cause of death and they didn't get healed on this side, I mean, God's word is still true. They're healed now. I mean, there's no sickness or disease in heaven. There's no cancer in heaven, right? But let's kind of look at it. Did you want to add something yeah, to that? Yeah, it just came to mind as, uh, listening to the ministry of Nick Stoyevich. Some of you know who he is, a very popular uh, evangelist, uh, man of God. He's a father, he's a husband, just, a, uh, just an extraordinary individual. And he was saying that healing, and, he, and he, he, he actually... He has no arms and no legs. Right. Uh, in fact, he calls one of his legs a flipper. And so... Uh, the point is that he says, that in actuality, if I'm a spirit man, I've received my healing, but not as some would count healing. It might not look like it in my body, but I know in my mind and in my spirit, I'm a healed man because I do more now without arms and legs than many a people with arms and legs would ever do. So just know and understand that even though you, your, your arm might have been blown off in the wars of Afghanistan or whatever the case may be, just, just, just because that limb might not have grown out as we hear from the miracles of times past, you can still walk in the fullness of your healing by way of your mind, understand that your spirit man is who you are. And whatever limitations your body might present, your spirit man will activate your mind and your senses in a way in which you can walk supernaturally in your healing and not it just be limited to your now, physical Now, I don't body. know if Chadwick Bozeman is a believer or not, but he just demonstrated that to all of us. He made four movies after his diagnosis. So his diagnosis wasn't him. He believed in something greater and continued to live his life accordingly. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 10, and we'll close right here for today. In Hebrews chapter 10, the context here is, is really contrasting the responsibility of the Old Testament priest versus our high priest, Jesus Christ, today. And I want to show you all, Jesus is done working. Somebody say, he's finished. What more do we want him to do? My God, he took 30, got beat to death. Hello, somebody. What more do we want him to do? And then rose on the third day. And we're still talking about, get him, Jesus. Well, not just that, but he spent three days in hell. Three days in hell on our Maybe behalf. He kept us free. Jesus said, I'm tired. I'm sitting down. I'm, and I'm, I'm done. Through. I'm, I'm done. Through. Now it's your responsibility to enforce what I provided for you. Are you all still with me? 
Let's read Hebrews chapter 10, 11 through 14. This is so good. And every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, Old Testament, which can never take away sins. But this man, somebody say this man. What's his name? Jesus. What's his name? Jesus. What's his name? Jesus. That's, that's What's when, his that's, name? Jesus. That's when you all were supposed to come in and we were going to have, do, a, do, do. We were gonna have a, then the church was supposed to just fall out right there, <laughs> clap, hand clapping and everything. So this, but this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever. Somebody tell me what was the one sacrifice? Himself, right? His death, burial, and resurrection, right? He did that one time for how long? Forever. Forever. Right? Watch this now. Set down at the right hand of God. So that's his position today. He's seated at the right hand of God. The right hand of God is symbolic of authority. So he's seated in the seat of authority. Watch this now. Let's keep reading. From that time waiting, the New King James says, but the King James says waiting from that time expecting. And if you look up that word waiting, it literally means expecting. And then the, the Greek there says, from some source. So Jesus is seated at the right hand of God with an expectation from some other source. Guess who that source is? Us. He literally has an expectation that we're going to enforce <laughs> what he provided for us. Watch this now. Till his enemies are made his footstool. Footstool there means foot rest. So if you can literally visualize what Jesus looks like right now, this is what he looks like. Jesus is chilling with an expectation that Kim will enforce everything that he provided through his death, burial, and resurrection. And I believe him and God just have conversations. Now, you see, Satan tried to kill Kim in that accident, and he wanted to infect her ability to walk. But Kim's not going to stand for that. Kim, Kim, li Kim literally is going to act on everything that I provided for her through my death, burial, and resurrection. And Kim's going to come out of that accident far greater than what she went in. That's right. And he is up there with that expectation that some other source, and that source is us, will make every enemy that he has A literally footstool. his footstool. The number one enemy is sin. And sin produces sickness, death, poverty, eternal death. But he is literally, folks, we have, get him, Jesus, go, Jesus. Jesus is resting right now with an expectation that we will enforce everything that he has provided for us. I don't know about you all, but Johnny, I can almost see Johnny had a motorcycle accident. And Satan was trying to kill Johnny in that motorcycle accident. I could almost see Jesus saying to God, now Satan tried to take out my servant Johnny there. But, but my watch plan's Johnny. not finished. Yeah, but Johnny's not done yet. I still got work for him to do. I'm going to start a church over in Atlanta called Linked Up Church. He don't and even I need know him yet. to be the business That's manager right. over there. So I want you to watch how Johnny responds to this. Johnny's going to get up from this accident, declare that by my stripes I have healed him from the crown of his head to the soles of his feet. And Johnny is going to come back greater than what he was prior to that motorcycle accident. And folks, I came to tell you today that Johnny is the business manager, chief of staff at Linked Up Church. Satan could not take him out because Johnny knew what the Word of God had to say. Come on, somebody. And he resisted that. He opposed that. And he made sickness an enemy. And he allowed Jesus to continue resting because he was enforcing what had already been provided. That's right. That's right. So what am I saying in contrasting that? It is God's will that everyone gets saved. But the reality is everyone won't on this side unless you literally enforce what he provided for you. You can sit there and take it if you want to, but you don't have to. That's good. That's I'm, good. I'm talking to somebody watching this broadcast right now. You don't have to. Jesus literally has an expectation that you have defeated that. Notice what I didn't say. I didn't say you will defeat that. You have defeated that. Whatever you're facing right now, hallelujah. 
I speak healing over these airwaves right now. In the authority of the Word of God, according to 1 Peter 2.24, that whatever sickness, disease that is ill in their bodies right now, we declare that by Jesus' stripes, they are healed now in Jesus' name. Somebody type in, I am healed. Come on, receive it right now. I am healed. Come on, say it out of your mouth. I am healed. Come on, say it again. I am healed. Now, I want you to lift both hands and just thank God for it right now. Come on, open up your mouth and thank God for it right now. That by his stripes, I am healed. He literally has an expectation that every child of his will walk in the freedom that he has provided for them over 2,000 years ago. It is no longer his responsibility. It is our responsibility to walk in everything that he has provided for. That's right. And we literally have that choice every single day of our lives. Hallelujah. 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 So from now on in your mind, I pray that you will always, instead of you expecting Jesus to do something for you to, again, my prayer is that you will always have this image of Jesus in your mind with his feet up on a footstool. And whatever it is that is opposite of who he is in your life is an enemy of his. And he's literally sitting there with an expectation for you to handle that. That's right. That's the image I want you to see. Anytime sickness, disease, poverty, lack, anything that doesn't come from God comes into your life, I want you to see an image of Jesus just seated. Just looking and waiting on you to enforce what he provided for you over 2,000 years ago. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That just resonates with my spirit right now, man. That, that is lifting me on the inside. He did not leave us without responsibility in this. That's right. That's right. So you responded the right way, Kim. You exercised. You ate right. You did everything you knew to do in the natural in response to what he, you believe he provided for you. And he Doctor, Doctors everything. told me if I had to listen to doctors, they told me I'd never play basketball again. I'd never run again. I've had three knee surgeries on this knee. I had a ganglion cyst growing into this knee halfway into the bone that at any point while walking, running, or jumping, I could have broke my entire knee and leg. I wore a knee brace for four years, and then finally it dawned on me. Now, I'm not telling you to do this. This is where my faith was. It dawned on me. I actually trust this knee brace more than I trust God. And I'll never forget the day I took it off, and I said, God, I believe you healed my knee. My wife is right here. I've not wore another knee brace. Now it's probably been 25 years. That's right. 24 years. Amen. So, so this all is. I'm, go, I'm add sorry. something to it. Go ahead, baby. No, go ahead. So all I'm saying to you all is we've been waiting on Jesus, but Jesus is actually waiting on you. And he is expecting you to make every enemy he has his footstool. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. So I would bid this question to you. What position does Jesus have in your life? Is he still on the cross? Is he still in the grave? If he, is he sitting with his feet on the ground waiting? Or truly, have you made his enemies his footstool? You determine that. He's already done it. But what position have you given him in your life? If you have never received Jesus, as your personal Lord and Savior. If he's still in that grave, I invite you, I invoke you, I encourage you to take him out the grave, take him off that cross, and lift him on high. Declare Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior intentionally. I said it earlier that when you make a decision, the decision comes with commitment, and that commitment comes with conversion, and that conversion changes behavior and thought. Make him your savior. Make him your Lord. Make him master. Give him access to heal you, to provide, to deliver you, to redeem you, to restore you. 
Or perhaps you've made decisions contrary to the Word of God. You know you've been living outside of His will. Remember, it's His will that all men be saved, but the reality is not all do and not all will be, even those that thought they were. So, if you've made a decision in your heart that you want to recommit your life to God, He ain't mad at you. He's not mad at you at all. In fact, He's not even counting, counting your sins against you. Once you say, I repent, I come to you once and for all, take my life and I live it for you, he's forgotten it. He's not only thrown it in the trash, he's put it in the garbage disposal. It's been ground up and off to wherever it goes. So if that's you today, we would love to pray with and for you. Or perhaps I'm going to even offer this. You haven't found that narrow gate, that good company of people that's willing to go to that narrow gate. And you've been watching us online. You might have visited us while we were still open. But you believe that God has called you to linked up church. And you've connected to the vision that's here. Connecting people to God, to family, to purpose, and to community. You have an opportunity right now to make that heart thought a commitment, a reality in your life. So again, if you have not received Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, you haven't taken him out the grave, and you haven't received him, you haven't lived for him, let's get that done today. What are you waiting on? Again, you, want, you know you've lived life contrary to him. You thought he was mad at you, but he's not. And you say, now I'm doing it for real, God. That was me. I had to, I had to make my, that commitment a couple of times. But when I did, I tell you, I never turned my back. Because when I paused enough to taste and see how good he was, I never wanted to push back from that table ever again. Or you want to make Linked Up Church a church home and you want to learn more about that? We want to pray with and for you. All right, praise God. So if you want to make that declaration, I want you to lift one hand towards heaven. And I want you to repeat this prayer after me. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I believe that he died, rose from the grave, and he is alive right now. Lord Jesus, come into my heart and save me now. As a result of what I've confessed with my mouth, what I believe in my heart, I am right now born again and in right standing with God, and all my sins are forgiven in Jesus' name. In Jesus Praise name. God. Can we just rejoice with them right now? Praise God. We don't get to see all of the responses, but we know every single week someone prays that prayer sincerely from their heart. Yes. I want you to take your next step, and let me tell you what that is. Fill out that connection card. Man, it would do God's heart so much good. But not only would it, do, would it warm God's heart, it's going to warm our heart as well. If you would just take that next step and fill out that connection card so that we can get you connected to God and on your way to having a relationship with Him that you always dreamed about having and living the life that you always dreamed about living. You will not regret If for whatever reason you won't regret that, if for whatever, whatever reason all you can do is type in, I prayed that prayer sincerely from my heart, we have a social media team, ministry team here that will follow up with you and be able to answer any questions that you may have. We love you, and we just want to say welcome to the family of God, and we can't yes. wait to meet yes. or see you in person. God Amen. bless you. Thank you so much for watching our online service. We certainly don't take that for granted. And if you enjoyed today's message and you want to get connected with us, we encourage you to become a part of our online community. That's right, and you can do that by subscribing to our YouTube channel, sharing this video with a friend, and following us on social media. Don't forget to meet us right here on this channel every Sunday for our services. If you desire to help us reach more people just like yourself and advance the kingdom of God, then click the Give button now. This will allow us to connect more people to God, their families, their purpose, and their communities. Thank you again for watching our service on today, and we'll, we'll see, see you next week. week.